Hello and welcome to the TLDR Show, a podcast where I distill the knowledge of books just for you. I'm your host Abdurrahman and I'm very excited to have you with me. For today's episode, we come to the finale of our series on human nature. In the last episode, we covered Wim Bigley and learned some great persuasion tools. Today, we will see how important is our attention when it comes to persuasion. Without further ado, let's dive into our final book, Persuasion, subtitled A Revolutionary Way to Influence and Persuade by Robert B. Gialdini. This book is a follow-up to Influence. There, we saw how the six principles work at the moment of influence. In Persuasion, the best quote that describes it in my head is by Abraham Lincoln. Give me six hours to chop down a tree, and I'll spend the first four sharpening the axe. Lucky for us, we don't need the four hours. We just need the moments before introducing our message to make sure that our audience are open and sympathetic to it. In the first few pages of the book, Dr. Gialdini gives experiment examples on how people were willing to pay extra to buy chocolate when they wrote a high pair of digits from their social security number before buying, and vice versa. Another one was in a wine shop, where the choice of music playing, German and French in this case, affected the likelihood of buying a wine of that origin. The core idea here is that there are what the author refers to as openers, which include anchors and priming among other tools, which we will go through today. These openers help in the persuading process by removing existing barriers. I break down the book's ideas into four main sections, the importance of attention and how it works, the power of association when using language and geography, the commanders of attention, and lastly, we will talk about the seventh principle of influence. Let's start with the importance of attention and how it works. The first key concept here is what's called privileged moments. It describes how a person's choice in a situation isn't really done by the examining of information, but by what had been elevated in attention at the moment of the decision. One of the tactics in diverting attention is questions. To be more specific, which words we use in them. Let me explain all of this. In an experiment, two scientists asked random passing individuals to provide them with their emails in order to get instructions on how to get a free sample of a new soft drink. In the first half, only 33% provided their emails. For the second half, the individuals were asked, do you consider yourself someone who is adventurous and like to try new things? Before asking for the email. Almost all said yes. 97% to be accurate, and 75% gave their email addresses. Now, why on earth would such a random question double the acceptance rate? Well, there are two key points here. The first one is on why 70 out of 72 random individuals consider themselves to be adventurous. The answer lies in what's called positive test strategy. It's our tendency to look for the hits rather than the misses in such statements which is similar to confirmation bias that we explored in the previous episodes. So, when we are asked biased questions such as, are you happy, or do you see yourself as a helpful person, we are likely to look into our memories for what confirms that statement. These answers don't have long-term effects, but they possess extreme power at the moment itself. This power comes from the second key point, which is the second principle of influence, commitment and consistency. In that privileged moment, we could easily be complied into agreeing to a request, such as giving contact information. And since we just said we are adventurous and like to try new things, we want to be consistent with that statement. What makes privileged moments so valuable is attention. Controlling others' attention in a certain direction have a huge impact on the effectiveness of persuasion. On a side note, you can look on YouTube for The Art of Misdirection to see how flimsy our attention is. It's an amazing video and I'll link to it in the show notes. There is also a famous free online course on Coursera titled Learning How to Learn, with more than 70,000 ratings. One of its main ideas is how our working memory has four attention slots. We use them when we are processing new information or actively thinking. So at any certain moment, we keep four chunks of information in our mind. I'm pretty sure you know someone who claims to have mastered multitasking. For them, let me present to you a new term. Attentional blink. It's when we can't register the newly highlighted information consciously when switching our focus between two or more tasks. So, 
even though they act as if they heard all of what you said while they're working, trust me, they didn't. Let's get back onto track. In Wimbigli, one of the persuasion tips that Scott Adams gives on shifting someone or a whole nation's attention is, and I quote, an intentional error in your message will attract criticism. The attention will make your message rise in importance in people's minds. Applying what Scott Adams says at a large scale, and we get agenda-setting theory. It says that the media rarely produces change directly by providing evidence and critical analysis. However, they are extremely successful in diverting attention by covering specific topics, and this attention is what makes the selected topics more important in the minds of people. In an ideal world, this shouldn't be an issue, since the media will present what's critical to the society. But in reality, whether the topic is boring, complicated, friendly, controversial, and other factors play a major role in deciding what topics to cover. In the summer of 2002, in Germany, after an incident where the news were discussing right-wing extremism, polls showed that the percentage of Germans who thought right-wing extremism as the most important issue spiked from 0 to 35%, and went back to 0 when the coverage stopped. So, why do we think what we're paying attention to is important? Because, rationally, it is usually the most important. But, as seen by the previous example, it can be manipulated easily. Professor Daniel Kahneman, the author of Thinking Fast and Slow, answered the question on what would improve everyone's understanding of the world. His answer introduces what he called the focusing illusion. It was summarized in his response essay, which is titled, Nothing in life is as important as you think it is while you're thinking about it. As always, I'll link to it in the show notes. Now, let's see what happens in our mind when an opener is introduced. In our previous example of the wine shop, the choice of music played persuaded the customers into buying a wine from a specific origin. Let's go back to the idea of the four attention slots we mentioned earlier from learning how to learn. When our attention is grabbed by the German music, it occupies a slot, and the secondary association of German names, wines, or anything else that pops in our mind may occupy the other slots, and thus limiting the potential of exploring other options. So, is it necessarily to have a very strong connection between the opener and the desirable action? The answer is yes and no. The yes answer is, if possible, find a strongly associated concept with your request, so it becomes the attention focus. If you want to promote no littering on the street, bringing the idea of recycling is good. If you want to ask for a pay raise, tell stories about generosities and acts of kindness when talking to your manager before asking for the raise. The no answer is that sometimes it doesn't require a connection at all. In Influence, when we discuss the principle of liking and how it can be increased by using the power of association, We mentioned the example of sponsoring events such as the Olympics and football leagues will associate the positive feeling of these events with the sponsoring brand. Another way is putting celebrities in brands' advertisements. This provides both social proof and liking to the brand. And as we mentioned, the association doesn't have to be logical, like having sports celebrities endorsing soft drinks. It just has to be positive. Now, let's move to the second section. We will discuss the power of association and how it can affect our pre-suasion by seeing it through language and geography. For language, its role is more than just conveying our message. It's our first line of pre-suasion arsenal. As Joseph Conrad, the Polish-English writer and one of the greatest authors ever, said, he who wants to persuade should put his trust not in the right argument, but in the right word. One of those ways used to persuade are metaphors. Using the correct metaphor can link your audience's mind to the right visual and stir emotions within them. Let's take an example. If you're discussing crime, you can use two metaphors, wild beast or spreading virus. Your choice will affect which solutions your audience would be more likely to accept. If the crime was depicted as a wild beast, it will convey a certain image of a beast and how it must be caged. This visual image will persuade your audience into accepting a more catch and cage solutions. On the other hand, if you go with the spreading virus metaphor, the visual will be different. It will be of the need to take control of the virus and removing unhealthy conditions. For the audience, they will be more open to accept solutions addressing the root problems that created crime. On a side note, metaphors use visual persuasion, 
And as we mentioned in Wimbegli, visual persuasion is the strongest form. This power of language and how we associate images with words should make us avoid certain words when trying to persuade. Instead of using the word used when selling an item, use pre-owned. Instead of cost or price, use purchase or investment. Now, let's move into the second part, the geography of influence. If what we hear has an effect on us, we can expect that what we see on our physical surrounding to have similar effects. Dr. Cialdini mentions an example when while writing this book, he had two offices. One at the university, where his view was of other academic blocks and surrounded by books and academic journals. His other office was at home, where the view was of the neighborhood and people walking around with magazines and newspaper on his desk. The parts he wrote at the university office were written in dry academic language. This is despite the fact that he knows his audience for this book are the public. But the visual feedback and his geography in this case persuaded him. The thing about geography is that it includes both external places and internal ones as well. Our memories and thoughts have their distinct places within us. And just like how our physical world can influence us, our internal world does the same. Let us see how it can influence our happiness. As we grow older, both our physical and mental abilities are impaired. On top of that, we get chronic diseases such as diabetes and hypertension. The paradoxical part is that despite all of this, older people are usually happier. One possible reason is that they just don't have time for it, in the literal sense. Their attention and focus are more on their happy memories, bright places, and the smiley faces, and the ones who can't focus on these aspects of life and dwell on the downsides are usually the grumpiest. In the book, The Myths of Happiness, the top three activities that can increase happiness are as follows. 1. Count blessing and gratitude at each morning and write them down. You can find 5 minutes gratitude journal templates online. 2. Choose to focus on the bright side of things, events, and situations. 3. Limit the time you spend on thinking of problems and negative thoughts. And just like exercise, you need to put effort every day till it becomes your habit. So use this internal geography to persuade yourself and prime it. If you want to be happy, focus on the good times. If you're going for an interview or an exam, focus your attention on the past successful experiences and hype yourself. Another way you can use in priming yourself is what's called the if slash when then statements. They are structured to help us be ready to achieve a certain goal or leave a bad habit. Let's see a few examples. Remember our chocolate cake from the first episode? If you want to lose weight, you can make the following statement. If later at night my friend brings chocolate cake, then I will make a cup of tea. In case that you have a report you need to complete, you can write. If later after lunch I have no meeting, I'll complete the report. If you are a procrastinator like I am, your statement can be, when I'm writing the script and get tempted to start watching Archer, I'll stand up, go wash my face, do some stretches, and come back to work. These kind of statements work better than the traditional ones, like, I'll complete my report today. The main reason is that they keep us on high alert to a certain time or condition. In a way, you prime and load your slingshot, and the moment the target appears, you unleash it. Now, with our current understanding of attention, let's talk about the commanders of attention, the attractors and the magnetizers. The attractors are features that attract attention by their nature. If the attractors are like the cover design of a book, the magnetizers are like the glue that holds the reader to keep reading. Let's start with the attractors, the sexual, the threatening, and the different. The sexual and the threatening are familiar to most of us, since they come from our instinct to reproduce and avoid harm. They are used in advertisements and social campaigns, from using models in ads to printing graphic pictures of cancer patients on cigarette packs. One of the key points for me was about how mentioning the dangerous consequences of let's say smoking, followed by providing some actionable help in the form of steps, programs, support groups, etc. is better than just conveying only the dangers. So the cigarette packs, instead of only having the images, they should have a line at the end for a helpline or support groups. The last attractor is the different. We all have this tendency to get attracted to the different. In the first Matrix movie, there is a scene where a woman in red 
walks and distract Neo's attention from what Morpheus was saying. If you are reading a letter, the bolded or differently colored words will attract your attention. Another example of how the different will hijack our attention comes from an example in Predictively Irrational. But this time, instead of using relativity as explanation, we will use the different. Let's say you were offered two cars, a four-wheel drive, let's call it car A, or a new sports car, let's call it car B. Both are excellent cars with similar prices, and you like both. For a salesman who wants to sell the four-wheel drive, he will introduce a decoy. The third option will be a car which lacks some of the features of the perfect four-wheel drive. Let's call it car A-. minus. The adding of the third option will attract our attention to the differences. Adding car A- minus attracted us to the different car A, which became focal in our attention and indirectly better than car B. As for the magnetizers, there are three of them, the self-relevant, the unfinished, and the mysterious. Let's see how we can use them. The first magnetizer of attention is the self-relevant. Any message that's personalized for the recipient will grab their attention. Just remember the festivity season. Compare the messages that were addressed to you personally to the generic ones, and God forbids, the forwarded messages. I will link in the show notes to a blog article by Derek Severus, which is titled, the most successful email I ever wrote. It's a short email that is sent to customers after making a purchase from their store. Here is a small tease. Our packing specialist from Japan lit a candle and a hush fell over the crowd as he put your CD into the finest gold lined box that money can buy. We all had a wonderful celebration afterwards and the whole party marched down the street to the post office where the entire town of Portland Waved bon voyage to your package. The key here is personalization. And as Derek says, it's often the tiny details that really thrill people enough to make them tell all their friends about you. There is another way where focus on ourselves grabs our attention. It's called the next in line effect. It happens in a group setting when we have to present or share something. And as a result, our attention goes internally and lose focus on what the person before us is saying or presenting. And we sometimes can even lose focus on the person after us since we can be analyzing what we just said. Let me give you some practical advice here. If you're leading a meeting where everyone has to update, be the last person to speak, so everyone's focus will be on what you are about to say. And for you not to fall in the effect yourself, maybe have someone summarize what everyone said. If you are just a participant, there are two situations. If you have good points to present, sit across the person with authority, so you become his center of attention. Also, don't present just before or after them, since they won't be focused on you. The second situation, if you didn't do your job perfectly and you want to escape, do the opposite. Sit next to them and present just before them. It might just increase your chances of survival. With saving your career out of the way, the second attention magnetizer is the unfinished, which is based on what's called the Zegarnik effect. This became one of my favorite names. Two takeaways from this effect. The first is that we will remember the details of unfinished tasks while we are committed to it. Maybe this is why we remember books details while we are reading them, but forget them when we finish. At least now, you have my podcast to go back to. The second takeaway from the Zegarnik effect is when you are interrupted or taken away before completing the task. We will have this nagging feeling and discomfort on wanting to return to finish it. This explains why one of the ways to help with insomnia is writing your tasks for tomorrow down and have them off your mind. It also shows the importance on why resolving problems with your partner and not letting them get unresolved. Practical advice for all of you writers out there that utilizes the Zegarnik effect from the book Daily Rituals by Mason Carey In the book, he talks about different famous individuals throughout history and their daily routines. Ernst Hemingway, the American novelist and the literature Nobel Prize receiver, used to do the following, and I quote, You write until you come to a place where you still have your juice, and you know what will happen next, and you stop, and to try to live through until the next day when you hit it again. For the last attention magnetizer, let's start by a quote by Albert Einstein. The most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It's the source of all true art and science. 
a good built mystery will always grab the audience attention and keep them on their toes. We see this in movies where they start with the end of the movie, in novels and in the annoying clickbait video titles. It is similar to the Zagarnik effect, where instead of having an incomplete task, we have an answered question that we need answers to. Now, for the last part, we will introduce the seventh principle of influence, the principle of unity. This principle works uniquely when we see someone that we identify as a part of our ethnic, racial, national, or religious group, our attention focuses on the similarities, and as we mentioned, the secondary concepts increase in importance. These shared identities change the context from, oh, that person is like us, to, oh, that person is of us. There are two categories of factors that produce this sense of unity. The first include ways of being together, and the second include ways of acting together. Being together can occur from two ways, kinship and place. For kinship, being of the same family is the ultimate form of unity, but we can utilize its powers beyond the family ties between strangers. Bringing our audience attention to familial images and labels such as brothers, sisterhood, motherland, or saying we are a family, can enhance the sense of trust and togetherness. The second way that can generate being together is place. Beyond home and family, we can also develop our sense of togetherness from our approximate surrounding and the people within it. You can see this with how people from the same city would feel pride to their neighborhood or people from different cities will have a special sense of belonging towards them. For the second category that produces unity is acting together. We can see this in marches, prayers, or even when chanting in football matches. This harmony in doing such activities leads to more liking and support within the group members. Activities such as team building, orientation, or induction programs are built around creating this sense of unity. In the book, there are three main engines that induce this sense of togetherness. The first is music. Singing and dancing together harmonize us and break boundaries like no other. Just try and go to a karaoke and see how people act at the beginning and by the end of the session. The second one is reciprocal exchange. If you ever saw videos that are titled 30 or X number of questions that lead to love, well, they are based on a New York Times article published in 2015 titled To fall in love with anyone, do this. The idea is that two strangers will take turns asking each other questions and answering them. As the questions progress, they will get more personal. This feeling of opening up and personal disclosure creates a sense of unity beyond mere reciprocation. The last engine that creates acting together is co-creation. Here, whether it's a physical product or a team project, the increased sense of involvement within the group members increases their unity. To wrap things up, Dr. Cialdini wrote, Who we are with respect to any choice is where we are, attentionally, in the moment before the choice. The basic idea of persuasion is that by guiding attention strategically, it's possible for a communicator to move recipients into agreement with the message before they even experience it. The key is to focus them initially on concepts that are aligned associatively with the yet to be encountered information. Today, we talked about how our attention is important and can be manipulated using privileged moments. The analogy for how they work was using our four attention slots. These slots can get occupied by openers, the attractors, or the magnetizers of attention. We also saw how our choice of words and both our internal and external geography can persuade us and prime us into a certain direction. And lastly, our seventh weapon of influence, unity, gave us a much simpler but wider look at what really moves us, our sense of togetherness. So make sure to use this knowledge to sharpen your influence acts. Now, this is the last episode of our first series talking about human nature. We started it with building the foundation for understanding our irrationality. We saw this irrationality in our automatic tape responses which are registered in System 1. Confirmation bias, cognitive dissonance, and our current understanding of attention gave us a deeper look at our inner nature. We also learned how the persuasion filter and the six main principles of persuasion work by exploiting these automatic tapes. Now, I would love to hear from you. Did you learn anything new? Have you used any of it? Did you talk to your friends about any of the ideas? 
What do you think about the episode's structure? Send me your thoughts on Twitter or Instagram at the LDR Show. For our next series, we will be shifting gears a bit. And to use the mysterious and the Zagarnik effect, I won't tell you the theme, but it's very related to the journey of the TLDR show and how it became to be. So stay tuned. As always, make sure to check the website at tldr-show.com for the show notes, episode transcript, links to social media, and the extra good stuff. Till next time, be curious, be critical. Thank you.